Good afternoon. My name is Alan Morgan. I'm with the Building State Capacity and Productivity Center uh, at WestAt. The Building State Capacity and Productivity Center is a federally funded, through the U.S. Department of Education, Division of Elementary and Secondary Education, initiative that's designed to support and help improve the productivity of state education agencies. And speaking of state education agency and state education policy, uh, this afternoon we are with the President, Jeremy Anderson, of the Education Commission of the States. Those of us who've had a long history with the Education Commission of the States um, know of its unique positioning in the, um, in the alphabet soup of education organizations. Uh, there are so many letters attributed to so many different organizations. When people think of ECS, the Education Commission of the States, they think of a unique organization that has representation that's pretty much different than all the others. They individually may have representation for various roles in state government, but none quite have the composite of influence and policy makers as does the Education Commission of the States here in Denver. Uh, Jeremy Anderson has been the president and has, um, having worked with virtually every prior president of the Education Commission of the States, has done a um, I think an incredible job of uh, being able to continue the advancement, um, the importance of this organization to state education policy makers, whether they're governors, legislators, chief state school officers, teachers organizations, business groups, university leadership. Um, ECS is now doing it all, and uh, in large part thanks to the staff and the leadership at the Education Commission of the state. She's had some great governors that have been organizing and helping support yes. your efforts. Uh, it is, uh, it's timely to talk with you about what is a major influence in state education policy coming from the federal level. Uh, you are in a somewhat unique position in the sense that you're one of the very few people thus far that's actually had the opportunity to review uh, five uh, vlogs, the video logs that we've done of chief state school officers around the country on the Every Student Succeeds Act. So today we're going to spend a little time, kind of see if we can't kind of bring this together, see what's there, see if there are some things that need to be talked about that maybe the chiefs, because they are all dealing with this from the perspective of their re responsibilities in leading their state's education system. Um, it's time to kind of step back from it and see what that 30,000 foot view looks like and Jeremy's the person to do that. So um, let's start with your taking a few minutes to kind of tell us how does the Education Commission of the States really see um, Every Student Succeeds Act and we asked each of the chiefs whether they could identify opportunities and challenges uh, I'm sure both register in your mind about right. what you can and should and will be doing. Uh, but my guess is knowing you, the big word is opportunity. How are you going to seize this opportunity, Jeremy, to, to help bring this about in a real way that influences positively student learning in this country? Well, that's a great question, Alan, and it's great to be here with you and uh, to be able to have seen the videos from those five chiefs. I think it's very um, instructive for us to see kind of their thoughts on what they're doing in their respective states and we can talk individually about some of those. I think at the Education Commission of the States, we really see the Every Student Succeeds Act as almost a generational change in education policy. I mean, we have states that for the first time in over 12 years are really being empowered to work on education policy in a different way. So it's not so much that they're responding to federal rules and regs, but they have some opportunity to really redefine some things around assessments and accountability about what they're going to do for reforming some schools, on how they can really focus on equity for some key demographics within their state that could really change the outcome and guarantee that every student has an opportunity to succeed. I think the, the reality that we're dealing with is that this is coming at a great time for the states, and there's a lot of amazing leaders there, but there's also a lot of challenges that are out there in the states. So the Education Commission of the States, we're committed to working with those states and individually with the governors and the chiefs and the legislators and state board members and the public in those states, usually around three major things. One is around key reports that we're going to be releasing. And those will be everything from you know, the top 10 questions about the Every Student Succeeds Act to a better understanding on what is a well-rounded education, sure. which is in that federal law a lot. 
But for the policymakers, we're going to be doing a lot with SS State Policy Academies and really getting into those states to provide the technical assistance so that states that are looking to tackle one of the many issues in the law aren't just trying to recreate it themselves. They're mm -hmm. learning from what all the other 49 states are thinking about and doing. That's great. So t take the, um, you mentioned a couple of key words there that not everyone who knows of, uh, of course it's a significant piece of legislation, hundreds yes. of pages, lots of words. You mentioned three of them, well-rounded education. How do, you, how do you see this playing out as states go about, I guess with a certain amount of individual capacity, uh, defining what well-rounded education really means? It's a key part that's in the legislation, and I think it's mentioned multiple times in many areas. I think well-rounded education is going to be an interesting policy change for a lot of states. I think when you look at the previous federal law, it really focused primarily on um, English and reading skills and then different mm -hmm. math and science skills. It didn't really look at broader areas, and there were some supporters and detractors with that decision. I think the new law focuses a lot on well-rounded education, and for states it means how do you incorporate arts into some of your English classes? Mm -hmm. How do you look at STEM in a more unique way? How can you take some of the classes that may have been more social studies and turn them into civics and engagement? And I think we're going to see some really creative ways that states are doing that. I can tell you it's one of the areas where we're getting a lot of calls from chief state school officers, from legislators, and from governor's offices. So you have observed um, a series of these video logs thus far. You've watched um, Secretary Pedro Rivera in yes. Pennsylvania. State Superintendent June Atkinson, North Carolina. Um, the Director of Education in Arkansas, uh, Johnny Key. Yes. You have seen the State Superintendent of Public Instruction in Oklahoma, Joy Hoffmeister. And you've seen Director of Education for the State of Illinois, or Iowa, uh, sorry, uh, Ryan. Uh, the State of Iowa, and that's Ryan Wise. So take us, we, we ask each of them, kind of what they saw as their principal uh, opportunities and challenges. And we asked them some questions about some other areas that you observed as you walked through or watched each of these videos. What, what are the themes you came away with that you thought, if you had to try to, to make in a fairly concise form, the key points that they were making and will be making to others as we go from this point forward and being able to utilize these video logs, what did you bring away from it? What did they see? Well, there were a lot of good ideas, and I think they all talked about key changes they're trying to make in their states. When I look at all five of them, they're amazing leaders in their own right in their states. Um, we saw a lot of the trends that we're seeing here at the Education Commission of the states from across the country. And I really put it into three categories. One is collaboration, one is communication, and one is continuity. I think all five of those chiefs talked about the value of collaboration. While a state plan is due in the summer of 2017 from each state, mm -hmm. The governor's office needs to review, but the legislature doesn't have to take any action. Mm -hmm. And most of those five chiefs are really focusing on collaboration, not only with all parts of government, but with the public and with key interested parents in school districts. Communication is a key one that we've seen. And we've seen from previous policies that have been put in place, it's never easy to put a policy in place, but it's easier to put it in place than it is to communicate what that policy means to the students and parents that it's going to affect. And so the communicating aspect is a big one that we see. And continuity is the third one. And I say continuity because all five of those chiefs are amazing leaders. But we're at a point in our country where 60% of the chief state school officers are new in their job in the last 18 months. So continuity of institutional knowledge is a big issue that I think states are going to be grappling with as they institute the Every Student Succeeds Act. Jeremy, let's take your comment about uh, having viewed these five video logs about the importance of uh, collaboration, communication, and continuity. So in the realm of collaboration, um, pretty simple, straightforward word. In government, not always easy to do. Right. There's a lot of territoriality. Some states, the communication and relationship, um, collaboration with certain officials is a bit more strained than others. In other cases, um, a governor appoints a chief state school right. officer or appoints the state board of education yeah. and has a significantly higher level of influence. So 
talk with me a little bit about, and our viewers, about what you see as kind of the, the key outcomes that really have to come about because of this collaboration? What, what incentive do they really have to make a difference with interaction with each other? Yeah, I think there's a lot of the states that are really looking to bring together some disparate people within their state, people who may not view the same issue the same way. But the collaboration is really going to be important in how an implementation takes place in a state. I think in many of these states you can say that, well, this is the responsibility of the state education agency that the chiefs run. Mm -hmm. But it's not that simple in a state if you're not really thinking about how you're engaging all of the different players across the state. Does the chief get along with the governor? Would they go to dinner together? I mm -hmm. mean, is the legislature one that has been playing well with education policy and being supportive? Or do they have a different view on it? But I think even more important on the policy side, what we're seeing in states is the question of, who are you really engaging for this conversation? I mean, are you talking with district leaders and with parents? Are you talking with representatives of key demographics so that you can mm -hmm. really find out what are the needs that they see in their community to have a meaningful education for their children? And we're seeing states that are doing that quite well. I know the five chiefs that have been videoed have all talked a little bit about the value of having collaboration and working across different lines. Collaboration from what we're seeing with ESSA is not just collaboration between the state education agency and the legislature and the governor. That's right. But it's really much deeper within the state saying, are you engaging business leaders in what the workforce needs are? Are you talking with key communities to make sure that there's representation for what's needed for English language learners or for key districts that may have lower outcomes than other districts? And how do we make sure that all students have an equitable educational opportunity? And that's really where I think collaboration is going to be a big key, where we're going to see some states that may have policies that are easier to implement because they've done the collaborative method mm -hmm. versus others where it was just a policy they put out and it may have been more difficult to actually see an outcome. Is ECS playing a role in uh, either today or do you expect in the future, in the near future particularly, in helping with this issue of collaboration in the following fashion. Let me explain my, my question a little more in detail. In some states, legislatures have taken on the responsibility of enacting fairly detailed language and requirements and putting them in law, getting them signed you know, right. by governors, um, because those were the expectations of No Child Left Behind or they were the expectations of the administration. They, in fact, have some real detailed laws out there across the United States. Those laws may or may not comport with the new latitude Correct. that the legislature, the governor, and the state education system has uh, under every student succeeds. So how do you encourage folks to kind of step back, rethink what's right for their kids at this time and this place um, under the new rules, the new sheriff in town with yeah. every student succeeds? Well, I think you're going to see that in almost every state. Uh, I think we've seen it at the Education Commission of the states where there are questions from a lot of these states on how do we do things differently and what are the opportunities for us to rethink some of these policies with the end goal of a better outcome for all students. But you've got to be realistic in some of this. I mean, there are some states who had some very difficult policy fights over assessments or over teacher accountability in the last two or three years. And the final product that was passed by a legislature and enacted by a governor, I would be surprised if that product was changed, even though there may be some new opportunities with Every Student Succeeds Act for the state to do differently. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily a negative for the state, but it's a reality that some of these states have already fought these fights, and they may wait a little bit to see how that decision mm -hmm. that was made and implemented in the last two or three years is actually trending. Mm -hmm. In other states, I think we're going to see some really um, game-changing education policies because the law allows the states a lot more opportunity to think creatively but also puts down some markers on how they need to be sure that all students are getting an equitable education and that they need to have focus on reforms mm -hmm. especially for school districts or students who are in the bottom five percent and so that's going to open up some other opportunities. So that leads perfectly into um the state's expectation, the, the responsibility that it has to communicate, then that's not a duty that is held in any of those state education policy makers individually in their roles. Right. It's held by all of us, all of them, um, and everyone has an interest in 
making this work for kids. So that said, uh, let me just say by way of a, a bit of an introduction to the point, um, just about a year ago, not quite a year ago, you were very helpful in kicking off a key conversation that occurred at a training on strategic communication. Right. It was a, uh, about 16 states had brought in teams of uh, players from the State Education Agency. Uh, the chiefs were sometimes part of that team. The upshot is it was a discussion about how to take how to identify these key strategic issues and go about developing a methodical but effective plan for communicating them and, and creating a, an open dialogue. So that being said, that was July of 2015. Um, uh, to my knowledge, most of those states are still moving full steam ahead. They now have some new challenges to come along they did not know they were going to have in July of 2015. What's What's your position or your the Education Commission of the State's position on how strategic communication can be undergirded, can be emphasized as an important, a, a very, very important element of what they do going forward to creating a plan? I think communication is going to be key, and you're right. The meeting that we had here in Denver that was a good partnership with some of the chiefs in Westad is a really interesting way for states to try to learn from each other, and I think that's the key part. Most state agencies, they have a really good idea about what they need to communicate, but they don't always have the staffing capacity or the funding to really get a message out and teach everyone in their state why this policy is of value or what are the values the policy brings for their family or their mm -hmm. students. I think the one thing that we would push the most, and at the Education Commission of the States, we're going to continue to talk to states about, is learning from each other. If one state is having success, I think on college and career ready standards as an example, Kentucky did some really good communication mm -hmm. early on with that. Mm -hmm. Those successes were opportunities for other states to say, how did they do that? And why did they communicate more often than we are? And what was the outcome from that? That's really where the value is. And so the opportunities for states to change the policies is great. The need for them to communicate the value to the parents, to the students, to the teachers, to the communities that they're serving, mm -hmm is probably even more important. So let me probe just a second further on the last of your three C's, and that's continuity for just yeah. a, a moment. Um, it's helpful to be able to, I, perhaps it's helpful, to come from the perspective of a couple of folks who either are doing what they have done now for four years is heading this major educational support organization, um, 13 years that I had as a chief state school right. officer, it is, that's not the environment today. And no. you made reference to it earlier. You've got a lot of folks that um, are still figuring out where to park the car and right. you know who all their employees are and what their assets look like yes. and frankly what their responsibilities include. Um, how, do you, how do you address this issue of continuity when, by and large, on the horizon, you mentioned something like 30-something new chief state school officers in the country right. within a certain, what, 18 the months or something months, like yes. that. So we have on the horizon other changes. You've got some other players who will be um, making decisions about that, whether it's the voters, in the case of whatever we have, what, four or five elected chiefs that are up in the mm -hmm. fall. Um, we'll have... Uh, decisions being made from governors, uh, whether they're going to run uh, or already out of the primaries and whether in fact they will end uh, right. appointing a new chief. Tell us about that. Continuity is a big issue in the states. Not only do we have 60% of the chiefs who are new in the last 18 months, and they're qualified individuals, and they're going to be exemplary leaders, but there's a lot that they're still learning about the capacity of their staff and how their budgets are funded and what they can and can't do without the legislature being engaged. But it's not just the chiefs that we're seeing this change in continuity. There used to be a time when the chairs of an education committee in the legislature were serving eight to 10 years as a tenure. And we're having a lot of turnover there too. We have currently, as of the last 18 months, 32% of the chairs of education committees are brand new as a chair. And, amazing. and they're taking on major education policies. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing it through elections also. State board members who aren't all elected, but some are elected, some are appointed. We had over 100 new state board members who were put into office just in the last year. And so all of this kind of transformation is happening at a time when 
institutional knowledge, understanding of what policies are working and what policies aren't working in a state is a premium when you're trying to figure out how to really change and reform a state education center. So one of the things we're doing a lot with these elected officials and with these appointed officials is having a lot more of these policy academies to not only give them the 30,000 foot view about what is trending in these areas around accountability and assessments or equity or mm -hmm. state plans or finance, but also to say, if you're interested, here's two states that are ahead of the game by these estimations. So you may want to try to get a hold of those states and learn from what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's really the value we provide at the Education Commission of the States, but it's key in my mind with all of the change we've had in these positions. Jeremy, when we did these five video logs with Chief State School Officers, we asked a fairly consistent set of questions about the Every Student Succeeds Act. One question that was for sure consistent across all five uh, was one that we hope gives the chief and now will give you an opportunity to raise some points that I didn't think about that we did not include in this kind of set of questions to talk about today. So the question of course is what did I fail to ask? What do you want to talk about? What does this forum give you an opportunity to say that we didn't give you thus far? Well, I think if there's one question, it would be, are states learning from each other? I think when we look out at most of the states, whether it's a legislator, a chief, a governor, um, they're really interested in knowing usually about five other states. It's usually the four that surround them, maybe the one they aspire to be. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is that for most of these states, going into a major change like the Every Student Succeeds Act, there's an opportunity to learn from many states. And so whether you're looking at accountability issues or assessments, whether you're thinking about equity issues or key demographics, or whether you're talking finance, talking to us here at the Education Commission of the States, we can usually give you examples of three or four states that are working on that same policy. Mm -hmm. It may not be your exact state, but there's always a valuable lesson to learn before you go into working on new policies yourself. And so making sure that the states are open to getting additional information at a time when, for most state education agencies that are going to put together a state plan, this is going to be a really big, long haul for them. And in many of the cases, they are state agencies that are relatively small. They haven't grown a whole lot in the last decade. So being able to learn from other states is a key way for them to have better policies and to see where they can hopefully have better outcomes to serve all students. So that point helps create an opportunity for me to um, provide a rather specific uh, note of gratitude to you, a compliment to Jeremy Anderson and to the Education Commission of the States. It strikes me, having had some experience in this business, not a great deal, whatever, it is important to not only have that communication among state officials, um, but it's also important to have the kind of level of communication among the organizations that exist for the purpose of supporting those state officials. So uh, those who do not know Jeremy Anderson, who do not know how active he has been in this arena of American education in the last four years, uh, Jeremy is a ever-present figure at other organizational meetings where, yes, some of your members will be there, but you make it a point to be there to represent the Education Commission of the State's interest and to learn from what they're doing right. so that those efforts do not conflict, that in fact they meld together. Jeremy is at the Council of Chief State School Officer meetings. He's at the National Association of State Boards of Education. He is at the National Governors Association. He's at the National Conference of State Legislators. Um, that alone would keep a normal human being rather busy. Um, but put that in conjunction to trying to guide and provide support to you and, and the governor to help this organization be what it really aspires to be. And you're moving in the right track to get that done. So uh, oh, thank a you. thank you from the behalf of those of us who have an, a, a stake and an interest and actually uh, still have kids um, uh, in the system. And, uh, even at my age, a 15-year-old at my house, I definitely have an interest in this uh, system right. doing what's right through Every Student Succeeds Act. So, so Jeremy, options. thank you so much for thank being a part of the challenge. conversation today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a part of this video log series. Uh, it, is, um, it was great to have the opportunity today to visit with Jeremy Anderson, President of the Education Commission of the States. 
And my thanks also goes out to the Building State Capacity and Productivity Center at West Ham uh, as we try to do what the name implies and uh, suggests, and that is to support state government and state education agencies in particular. Thank you for viewing with us.